So Abraham, Mike Reardon, it's good to have you and your team with us. We're looking forward to this case. Uh, we're getting everybody up here on the panel, but maybe you could introduce us to your team. Great. Thanks, uh, Mike. Thanks, Ron. Congratulations on a great meeting thus far. And uh, uh, on behalf of the UPMC team, uh, it is an honor to be here with uh, you all today. Welcome to Pittsburgh. Uh, next to me is my friend and colleague, Dustin Kleiner, who's the director of our cath lab. Uh, Amber McConney, who's our international cardiologist. In fact, she's a young CRT leader. So uh, she actually flew back for the case. She was kind enough to do that. And she's going to fly back this afternoon to D.C., uh, so, so her commitment to CRT there. Uh, we have uh, Ron, Chan, and Katie with uh, anesthesia uh, with the OR and lab team. We have uh, Sam, Wendy, Sarah, uh, Haley, John, Stephanie. Uh, I think I got everyone. Uh, and with the Abbott team, we have Santiago, Tommy, Gary, and Alicia. Uh, so we're glad to be here. And with that, we will get started with our case presentation. Perfect. Amber, Amber? Let me tell you about who we have here for you, because we have a oh, great team you. here with you. We have Maurice Buckbinder here with me. To my left is Greg Fontana. Greg, of course, was the initial PI on this and has really uh, right. taken the portico to where it is today. Isaac George, Andrew, Andrew Grosswig, Jim Hermiller, Hassan Jawali, Paul Mahoney, Giorgio Medrandra, Gus Prichard, Ramon Casada, Alfredo Rodriguez, and Steve Yakovov are all here. So we have a great panel for you. We're really looking forward to your case, so take it away. Thank you. Great. He goes fast. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a who's who. Uh, so if we weren't intimidated excellent. before, we are now. So He can do that anytime. <laughs> yeah. we're, we're surgeons. We don't waste time. <laughs> All right. Let's move forward. All right. Thank you for joining us. So just to give you a little bit of background on our patient, uh, our patient is an 81-year-old female. Um, her height is uh, 152 centimeters. She weighs 100, and, uh, 100 kilograms at a BMI of 43. She was having NYHA class three symptoms. In terms of her past medical history, she does have sick sinus syndrome and has a permanent pacemaker. She had a prior stroke and a TIA in 2018. She also has a history of hypertension, type two diabetes and chronic kidney disease. With her past medical history, this gives her an STS prom of 3.2%. So she was deemed high risk by our heart team. Next slide, please. One thing just for full disclosure, uh, guys, this, she's a, <laughs> this patient was kind enough to be our backup patient. Our first patient actually w had uh, violent vomiting and diarrhea and likely has a flu. Uh, so we, didn't, we did not want to or did not plan for a patient with a, a pacemaker to begin with, uh, but uh, she was kind enough to agree to be our life case this morning. Good Sorry, for you. No. So, so, so if this patient's had a stroke and a TIA, it looks like they're in sinus rhythm. I mean, is there carotid are. disease? Or are you going to use a sentinel in the face of carotid disease? How are you going to treat the stroke risk? Yeah, absolutely. So we, we just put a sentinel in place, and we'll play the loop for you uh, in a minute. Amber, do you want to just go over our sentinel strategy now? Absolutely. Uh, so okay. ever since uh, Protected Taver at TCT, we have kind of refined our sentinel usage to select category of patients who have bicuspid aortic valve disease, have a prior valve and valve, or have a prior history of stroke. That's so light, that given that that is the case in this patient, we elected to use Sentinel. So, so it's a selective use, essentially, to summarize what Amber said. Uh, we've gone from universal to that. So. Yeah, absolutely. So this is her baseline T, uh, TTE. You can see that she has some heavy aortic valve disease. Um, and a mean gradient that's measuring about 42 millimeters of mercury. In addition to having a severely calcified aortic valve, she also has some prominent MAC there as well. Next slide, please. So we'll take you through the CT scan at this point. We have gotten away from routine coronary angiography in most of these folks, uh, and we're doing a CT coronary angiogram at the time of our TAVR CT. Uh, she had a calcium score of about 20 with non-obstructed proximal LAD disease, as is laid out there, and nothing else on the CT. Next slide. We go through all our CT analysis in-house here. Uh, this video is sped up. I have had my coffee, but I don't move this quickly. Uh, you can see that we've got our uh, crosshairs that we're aligning in the top bottom right-hand image. We've got our created annular plane, and we're tracing that to end up with our annular perimeter uh, of about 72 to 73 in this case. Uh, we look at the sinuses of Valsalva, which are 29 to 30, uh, certainly large enough for a 27 millimeter portico, Navator, uh, and then you see the corner coronary heights here, which are acceptable, uh, left main and right coronary height. And we'll show you the annular max and min here in a second for choosing our predilatation. Uh, we do predilate all of our self-expanding valves. Uh, so we'll show you that here in just a second. Next slide. 
And one thing to add to Dustin po Dustin's point, you know, we we've pre-dilated virtually using the men, uh, and that's what you'll see here in this case. So our femoral access, she's got hip replacements and a little bit of uh, of depth as far as the access, but adequate uh, vessel size here for uh, positioning the flex nav system. Next slide. So we've selected a 27 millimeter valve with an annular perimeter of about 72 to 73 sinuses that are 29 to 30. Certainly a borderline case. When we have a borderline case, we like to size based on uh, the sinuses of Valsalva and the largest valve that the sinuses will accommodate. So we've chosen a 27 here. Next slide. Our case plan. So 73, sinus is 30, as we mentioned, uh, area. We've got a 12 French right femoral access that we've got two per closes in place. We've got a five French left femoral uh, for our angiography and temporary pacer there. And we, uh, as Dr. Salton said, we've put the Sentinel in from the wrist. We're gonna use the Abbott circular wire, which is an extra small in size. So we'll demonstrate that. We're gonna pre-dilate with a 22 Z-Med given the minimum of 21, uh, maximum annular diameter of about 25. And we'll show you our modified cusp overlap technique that we've used for the Abbott valve. Next slide. Dr. Sure. Sultan will take you through some of the parameters pa of the valve. Pause this for one second, Rich, for us. Uh, so if you can zoom down here where our hands are, you may need to turn this light on for uh, us to see. Uh, this is a circular wire. We, we did the first in man, uh, I think a few months ago now. Uh, this is very similar to other pre-shape uh, uh, wires, such as Safari or Confida. Uh, we use an extra small virtually in 95% of our cases. Uh, handles its shape very, very well. We've actually transitioned to this. Uh, one of the things you'll notice compared to other self-explaining platform, we, use a, we used to use a Safari, now we use a circular wire. Uh, the nice part about the FlexNav delivery system, and you see this with Evolute FX now too, is that you really don't need the wire to position. Uh, and it centralizes itself very nicely as you'll see shortly. Uh, and, and we've really moved to using this for, for all our cases as opposed to Lunderquist. Let's take that back. Okay. So going back to this, so if you wanna just play through this, uh, this little movie, I can just go over a few uh, points as to why this has become our valve and delivery system of choice for high-risk patients. Uh, so first of all, it's an intra-annular valve. Uh, large cell diameter, has this animated cuff, uh, you know, like I call it, I'm sure the, the trade name is something different, uh, which really moves with the cardiac cycle. One of the things we've noticed is it's not uncommon for us to have trouble getting a 12 or 14 French sheet up the iliofemorals, but can really get this uh, delivery system up very nicely uh, because it happens to be very flexible, very hydrophilic. There's a stability layer uh, next to the integrated sheet, which really allows for deployment. Now, this, this particular platform so it has, a, it has this kind of pop-off valve, so you can't really go past uh, the 80% mark, and that allows you, you know, when you're teaching somebody, allows you to really lock themselves out. Um, and, you know, from a recapture, it'll be very similar to other self-expanding valves. Uh, one of the other things that we note, again, is not using the wire for deployment. There's an indicator marker, so you can tell exactly how much you've gone, uh, how far you've gone, and there's some micro wheels for adjustment uh, along the way. So, so that's the animated cuff in, in delivery. Can we move the? Can we show the delivery system now? If you can bring that up, turn the uh, lights on. I'll show you what that looks like. Mm -hmm. So here's the atraumatic nose cone again, very flexible, uh, very flexible delivery system. This is the integrated sheet back and forth that we take. Uh, the stability layer right here, close to where my right hand is. Yep, thank you. And this is the deployment indicator, which tells you, and you'll see it popping off uh, as uh, Dustin deploys this uh, as we're going over next. All right, I will stop there. Any questions uh, before we get on with the case, uh, Mike and panel? No, yeah, so I do want to point out that we can do this because it's now commercially available. It was, a, it was approved based on the Navator trial, which you and your site were high enrollers in. So thank you very much. Uh, it gives us an opportunity to get this valve out to the market and have you show it to us. No, thank you. And thank you for your leadership of the trial, Mike. That was huge. So <clears throat> let's go ahead and show us, uh, show the two, our pre for loop. Uh, we'll show our angle. Uh, we can. Uh, We've done a little work, so we'll show you where we've started here. 
You want to walk us through the Sentinels? Justin? Sure. So we've got the, we, we just use a coronary wire in place. We've got our Sentinel that is in the anominate. We often will put a wire in. So we've got a landmark there uh, torquing around and then placing this here. So this is a live fluoro capture. Uh, first filter took, uh, you know, a very brief amount of time to put in. And then we will pull this back. We'll separate the handles, sort of engage the ostium of the carotid, and then advance the filter over the pro water wire or coronary wire, pull the wire back. Um, next picture. And we've then taken our, uh, just a J wire here across the valve. We've got a catheter, pigtail catheter in the non-coronary cusp. This is our uh, sort of modified cusp overlap view derived from CT scan. You can see there's some aortic root calcification. And we really just want to look for isolation of the non-coronary cusp here, which we have. This is where we are. Um, so we've got a pigtail in now, and we will advance the circulo uh, and proceed with BAV. So one of the things we'll walk you through when we do a modified cusp overlap technique is a little different. Uh, you may have noticed is that, one of the things you may have noticed is that it's unnecessary to pace with this platform, but we still pace. What we don't do is rapid pacing, but we do fast pace throughout. Uh, the advantage there is you can maintain nice hemodynamics and you can really allow the valve to open up as the night and all warms up. Uh, again, as we talked about, we BAV 100% of our patients for self-expanding valves, including Navitor, uh, using the minimal uh, dimension. We use a compliant balloon. So there's a 22 by four Zemit balloon that's going in uh, quick, and we'll do this under rapid pacing. Quick, yes. Quick question, this Gus Pichard. What do you call modified cusp overlap? Can you tell the audience? Yeah, you got it. Thanks, Gus. So, uh, you know, our modified cusp overlap essentially involves uh, is instead of rapid instead of uh, rapid pacing, number one, we fast pace. Uh, number two, uh, we always take a separate measurement. We don't go necessarily true LAO, uh, but what we do is we go AP and then swing over to LAO as opposed to going directly from cusp overlap view. We've learned this from Ganesh Manoharan, who has obviously an extensive Navator experience with an exceedingly low pacemaker rate. Uh, and I'll, I'll walk you through it as we do that. Right. So we'll go our BAV here. John, you ready to pace for us? Okay, pacer on 180, please. Okay, capturing. Okay. And tell the audience, how did you choose the nice. dimension of that balloon? So that's the minor axis on the CT scan. Floor pacer store. off, please. Mm -hmm. That's the so we got a 21.2 minor axis on the CT scan. Since we're using a semi compliant balloon, uh, we ch chose a 22 balloon today. The major axis was 25. Yeah. You do balloon dilation on all patients? All, we do pre-dilatation uh, pre on every self-expanding valve that we do. Yes, that's correct. All right, we just, good. you know, I know the data is a little bit mixed about it, but what we've noticed, quite frankly, is that, uh, you know, the post-dilatation rate is low. It allows the valve to conform and really, uh, you know, expand nicely in, in place. The radial force here is no different than other commercial self-expanding valves. The opening force is slightly different, perhaps, more theoretical than clinically applicable. Uh, but again, this allows us to, uh, to really get this comfortably. Can I get a dry sponge? Sure. And remind me of our ACT, please. We're, we were 301, is that correct? Thank you. Okay. Hello. So once, once we engage this, I'll show you what the valve looks like in delivery. So again, this is, the, this is our delivery system integrated sheet, equivalent to 1415 French. Uh, we have a circular wire in place, and you can see how smoothly this goes, quite frankly. Um, so I'll pause there for a second. Let's get a blue towel up here, please. And you said 14 And I'll need French, a change right? of gloves. Sheath. Correct. Oh. Yes. Let me Hello. take that valve uh, and show you what that looks like. You know, with respect to the uh, pre-dilatation, I think with the original Portico platform, it was mandatory almost. But no longer. And now with this, uh, you Absolutely. know... Better uh, as, as uh, radial force on the Navator. Um, you know, I, I wonder if it is as necessary. If you don't typically use this in self-expanding platform. Well, we have yeah. Greg Fontano, you know, the <laughs> PI, the, tra the original trial. Next, man, Greg. I mean, are you, are you still pre-dilating all yours? Uh, yes, we do. Especially in Portico, I think predilation is very, very important. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you know, I mean, I think we, we do it, quite frankly, in our, for our Evolute patients, too. We've just gotten into the habit of it. You know, we haven't seen an increase in stroke rate, uh, but we have seen decrease in post tilts at least locally. So this is what the Navator valve looks like here live. Uh, as you can see, intraannular valves, uh, leaflet starts right away, bovine leaflets, night and all frame, very large cell design. So anytime, uh, you know... It's a dream to cap someone. Dustin has to cap the Is it, is it, it is softer great, or uh, from bigger? That How much is it? 
measurements are softer or how softer meaning how the radial force yes yeah, so the opening radial force is a little different. Uh, it's slightly okay. less. I don't know the exact number, so, so don't quote no, me on it. But, before, you, uh, before you take that valve away, can you show the ceiling skirt oh. and how it's hooked to the nodes? Can we get close enough to that and how it can fl sure. flower Absolutely. out Happy during, to do uh, that. I think Happy that's one of the unique so points of the, how they change, change the original Can I see a pickup, please? Avatar. You got it. Yep. Thank you. So this is the ceiling cuff, and that's a great point. Uh, you know, Dustin and I have this argument in clinic, uh, you know, I should say virtually every week. We look at it and say, you know, what's the difference? And one of the things we noted, quite frankly, is that it wasn't a big difference going from Portico to Navator, but it really helps us treat these calcified annuli. So I don't know if you can see my forcep here. You may have to zoom in a little bit more. This is what, what I was referring to as an animated cuff, which opens in diastole and, and is, you know, helps seal in systole as well. So this is what really makes a big difference in PVL rate. And, and I know Mike and, and Greg and Paul are going to present some of the data from the trial. Uh, and, you know, this is part of what's responsible for such good results. Yeah, I think that was one of the things that, that helped change uh, PVL rates was a, the skirt and this uniqueness of how it, it flowers out like a parachute. Absolutely. And, uh, Great. Is there any way that you um, can do on the back table some kind of commissural alignment? Or is there a process that's reasonably successful? Yeah, so good question you, you asked that. So, you know, Lars Sondergaard and his team have done a significant amount of work in this process. So what we know is if we use a separate sheet, it's easy to uh, spin. And I know what the engineers are working on for Navator is that the valve is going to be preloaded in a specific pattern, meaning that as soon as we go in and we have our port uh, face certain way side port, we're going to be commercially aligned 95% of the time. So in fact, we're working on that right now. According to Lars' data, we did try to replicate it. The difference is, as you can imagine, patients are a little bit different size in, in Europe versus Pittsburgh. So uh, we have not been able to have that kind of ability to spin the delivery system and see that in translated in motion uh, once we get across. Yes, you show it to us when you do that. Absolutely. So we've demagged here so you can see us go across the arch just in the presence of Sentinel and make sure we're not interfering. You can see how smoothly this will go. And we're going to stop above and mag, up, please. mag back and adjust okay. our pigtail here. Go ahead. All right. Uh, let's see. So one of the things, and, you know, I think Paul had pointed this out to us a while, and we've really changed our philosophy on this, which is we really try to inch in very slowly. So even though the nose cone is, is very atraumatic, uh, a little bit more wire before we go mm -hmm. in, uh, we try to inch in very slowly. The nice part is the radio pick markers are very nice, right? So what you're seeing at the bottom of the pigtail is just the frame going to unsheet. The valve is about three millimeters from the dot, distal to it. So what we'll do is once we get into position here, we'll start unsheathing and we allow the valve to descend. So, and we'll fast pace through the process. All right, okay. let's go ahead. We'll start, and Dustin's gonna start uh, unfurling now and as I uh, allow the whole platform to descend here. Pacer on, one, four, zero, please. And, you know, nice way is if you put this, bot, this dot at the bottom of the pigtail, you're going to be at three millimeters and forget about everything else. Give us an injection, please. Inject, please. And Nibs, talk right. about how much movement you see as you deploy this. Is this pretty stable you as you deploy? You tell me. Yeah, you tell me, Mike. I'm not yeah. doing anything. Uh, you know, it's, it's very, very stable. And, and, again, we're not pacing at 180 or so, right? Yeah. Uh, very stable. Very little movement from my part. Uh, one of the things that you probably know, <clears throat> wean pacer to 120, 180 and off. One of the things that you know, Mike, from, from the other self-explaining platform is that, you know, th they used to dive, right? Yeah. And, and you see this is just so smooth, right? I mean, it just, it doesn't do that, which is kind of nice. It's a very slow deployment. When we get to annular contact, we speed up a little bit further. And you can hear those clicks as I was deploying. That's at 80% deployment, and that's the lockout mechanism. There's a button to depress. It will not allow us to go past that 80% point unless we depress that button. So this is where we stop, assess hemodynamics, and take some pictures. Rich, can you point to it? Dustin, do you mind just doing that one more time for the sound? And so, Rich, if you don't mind just showing the indicator here, please. So we can turn as much as we want. We're yep. clicking, but we're not moving the indicator. We've got a button that you can see that is exposed here. Unless I depress that button, we will not go any further. Okay. All right. So you did it so for now we'll, 100 for pacemaker, and then you stopped. We did. We paced at 140. Uh -huh. 
And uh-huh. now we've weaned from 140, 120, right. 80 and off. So we slowly wean that. And now we're off. And remember, she, she has a, a pacer problem. here. So, yeah. That was an amazing. So, uh, that was an important yeah, just, to, just to avoid for PVC. How stable this valve is. You deploy mm-hmm. very fast at the contact, and the valve did not move, did not dive into the ventricle. Beautiful Correct. demonstration well, of that. Mm. Thank you. We'll, we'll save the compliments until it's all said and done. Yeah. <laughs> well, I, I tell you, we're going to do a dry like here. We... a little low and your LV's banging. You ought to because... give your anesthesia to get yep. a little fluid. Yep. So this is just dry? <laughs> yep. They, they, they did, actually. Let's go ahead and do that some more, please. Great point, yeah. Mike. We can work in some saline, please. Thank 500. You. Okay. All right. Ready to inject for us? 1525? Inject, please. Good. So about, you know, two to three millimeters. We took the parallax out, as you can see. Uh, from where we are now, we're going to go to straight AP uh, and then go swing over LAO to take the parallax out. Generally, it's about, you know, 20, 30 degrees. Yeah, the LAO That's where we are now. Yep. Now we're going to pay attention mostly to the left cusp, left sinus here as we've scrolled over. Get ready to inject for us? Yeah. Inject, please. Yeah, that's good. That's great. So you're really yeah, using I'm kind fine. of Ganesha's so. technique for all this. Yep, exactly. So it's a combination of Ganesh and overlap. That's why we call it the modified cusp overlap. What do you guys think here? We should call it the Pittsburgh technique. <laughs> it looks great. <laughs> He's trying. It's, it's, it's more legitimate when it comes from you, Mike. <laughs> how much is it, you think? One, how many millimeters you have? Top? One millimeter? So this millimeters? is a little bit dis- misleading, right? So we're about two, two and a half on the, yeah. on the non. We're probably the same here. We're going to take another picture in, in you want to go to coplanar? Let's, yeah, we'll show yeah. you a coplanar view. I think it will make a lot and more sense here. So let's show you a better, coplanar so. view. This is just Flora here. All right, that's pretty good. Yeah, he's better. Awesome. Yeah. Watch just the face there. This is Flora. All right, now and remember, we've got because we're a coplanar, we'll have parallax yep. on the frame. When we take this picture at the end, if we're comfortable and confident in our CT measurement, we'll have no parallax after the valve is released. Okay. Inject, please. There we go. Yeah, so we've captured, similar, you yes. can kind of see, you can capture both the, the yeah, front and the back, you know. So yeah, on average, it turns better. out to be at two millimeters. So we'll come back to this to and take this at the end. Good. Yeah. Any other comments from the panel? Uh, Let's just talk about how you're going to manage the wire when you release. Sure. Yeah, you got it. Thanks, sure. Paul. Great point. Greg, any questions? So do, right. you, do, you, do, you do, uh, do you do any surface so echo while you're right looking away. at this? I mean, we usually like to wait a couple minutes so with these valves. We do. Up. We do a surface echo to keep yeah. ourselves occupied. <laughs> <laughs> well, Greg, yeah, usually questions? we try to tell Discussions? stories to each other, to be Obviously, honest with you. Let's go back a little good. bit more. We'll ask at the end. Yeah. Let's, so we've got forward. the wire all the way back into the catheter, obviously. I think it's still there. Let's pull back a little bit more. Yep. There we go. So okay. We've got our nose Good. cone released. So we're going to go ahead and take our pigtail out. Okay. Well, now we will now rapid pace. So pace around 180, please. We want to really go nice and slow here. You see Dustin click that button. I'm more or less neutral here with maybe slightly forward because, you know, we're pretty centralized. Okay. And you will see some movement on release here again. That's the parallax that will shift to the coplanar view as opposed to this LAO view that we're in. We've added parallax by coming to this LAO view. Do a little more. A little faster. There we go. Okay. And you'll see another ratcheting sound. Going till we Chaser wean to 160, 140, 120. Floor start out, please. 100, 80, and off, please. Okay, pressures so are covering what, nicely. Do what you always need? pace? I'm sorry? Do you always pace? We do. We, you know, <laughs> yes. we, we really, and as you can see here, we've gone back to that coplanar view, and I'll talk about that in one second about the pacing. We've gone back to that coplanar view. We're completely off. We're going to introduce a little wire, pull back to the descending right. thoracic here. Okay, we'll stop there. Recapture. Do, yep. Let's, let's show this one more time, Rich, sure. uh, towards where the delivery system uh, is, the ability to recapture here. So what uh, we've done to depress the nose cone and pull the nose cone back, we've got two buttons on the end of the sheath, and we depress both of those buttons and pull back in one motion until we have the nose cone back within the delivery capsule. And then we will add wire, and we'll take the whole thing out, put our sheath back. So the pacing question, you know, we, we see little downside in this. We have not seen... Uh, you know, folks with Mm -hmm. increasing ventricular arrhythmias from doing that. We really feel that the stability on release is an adequate price to pay uh, for having a a short pacing run. This pacing run is slightly longer even than than, uh, uh, the the other self-expanding platforms may be. We're really trying to go slow and release one tab at a time. Uh, But we do always pace for stability. 
Yeah, the pacing at the end, you think it's better than what you have done prior to. You think yeah, it's, it's a little faster, right? So because again, that those last little motions is what Dustin was pointing out, where you know it, the valve can pivot depending on how if you're on the lesser curve, greater curve. Uh -huh. Because we don't use a Lunderquist here, the entire valve doesn't get buried into the into the non, which is what you see commonly, uh, you know, in other platforms. So as we're exchanging this pigtail, I want to demonstrate something. We've gone back to that LAO view that we deployed in. We have absolutely no parallax on the frame when we deployed the valve. You see a bit of parallax on the frame currently. And as wow. I said, if we go back to our coplanar view, CT derived, which is where we took the picture where we did see the parallax initially, we'll go back to that now and you'll see that our frame is well aligned. So this is what you know, Ganesh goes with frame alignment versus cusp overlap. So we've tried to kind of take the best of both worlds and both recipes to try to do that. So here are hemodynamics. Uh, Rich, can you show that on the screen for us, please? Yep. John, you got it? All right, let's pull back. All right, let's take a picture and see what we look like here. All right, let's center that a little bit if we could. Sure. Or, uh -huh. Perfect. Okay. okay. Ready for us, Taylor? Inject, please. All right. What do you guys think? Beautiful. 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 Well done. So, uh, right. this is Ramon Quesada here. Congratulations. A let's take a look with Echo Stephanie can while we're comment, waiting. Can you comment on the, uh, which is very attractive about this valve, is that you are always going to have coronary access. So can you comment yeah. in the future? What I'm gonna have to I'm gonna have Dustin comment on this because he's been he's been waiting for this valve for I, a long, I, long I, time. I'm, I apologize, I didn't hear the question. Comment on the valve. Comment on the coronary axis on this. Oh, uh, the coronary axis is a dream come true. Um, I, you know, we we have had a lot of of, of frustrating times uh, getting back Rich, in with our other self-expanding platform. We we really uh, enjoy cathing people through this. The valve leaflets having a slightly lower position. The other thing we've noticed, if you look at the inflow portion of the frame here, it's straight up and down. There's not as much taper on the bottom of the frame as there would be uh, with the other self-expanding platform commercially available here in the states and that allows us to put this in at a three or four depth rather than an extremely high depth and we've not really seen a significant difference in our pacemaker rates yeah. by doing that i feel that the inflow yep. portion of the frame has something to do with that uh, but coronary access is, is is really nice here so to the second part of your question and this is important because mike's probably sitting next to you and he's a study chair for vantage so you can nudge him a little bit you know this valve is great for high-risk patients and it's become more or less our default valve for high risk patients. Stephanie, our, our all-star sonographer here, is showing us our images, which are, are, are not great in this patient with a BMI of 42, uh, but we're going to do our best that we can here and, and, and see if we see leak. We didn't see any with the aortogram, obviously. Mm. Uh, we'll see if we can get either a parasternal or an apical long here to show you what we're looking at. You can take that off if you need to, Stephanie. And what was the gradient, John, that you got? Uh, my was the, uh, 11. Okay, and this is in a hyperdynamic patient, obviously with a ventricle. I mean, at 30 days, this is going to be in the single digits, and and that's what we've seen based on our 30-day data. And and we just presented, uh, I believe it's a poster. One of our fellows just presented a poster on the one first 100 nav, excuse me, porticos comparing hemodynamics at 30 days uh, to both uh, balloon expanding and other self-expanding platforms. Do you see leaks here now? Maybe small. We don't see any leak at all yeah, on the echo leak. as we're scrolling through. Uh, you know, and we, we also feel, given the construction of this cuff, this is something that that sort of retrograde filling that prevents leakage back into the ventricle, having a depth of a couple millimeters is helpful here rather than closing that off. So yeah. uh, we're very satisfied with this implant depth, and I, we, we don't expect to see any leak here. Yeah. And that's been our, you know, and, and again, it's, you know, we used to joke that, you know, we, we didn't see a ton of leak with Portico, and this is only going to be significantly better. Um, I, I think there's some, obviously, Navitor and Portico users, obviously, Mike, Paul, others, uh, Isaac, uh, Greg on the panel. Any comments from you guys? What's your experience been like switching over? Yeah, what's the thought? Greg, you, you led the trial, the IDE trial. Why don't you comment on this? Well, I, I think that there's um, some pretty important step functions along the way. Clearly, the Flex Nav delivery system that was a game changer, uh, much easier to access and <clears throat> move through the circulation. Uh, it certainly added to the stability during deployment. And I, I think, you know, the uh, PBL rates are clearly been reduced significantly. So, you know, as we've, as we've improved with the technology, also the technique along the way, um, 
both the cusp overlap and modified versions thereof is, have further helped us in, in getting better and better uh, rates of uh, pacemaker. I'm going to speak on it a little bit later today if, you have a f if you're interested. Um, and try further understanding the depth and the relationship to the uh, membrane to septum length, et cetera. So as we want to get to a very precise delivery depth, uh, having a great delivery system and a valve that, that is functioning right away with minimal need for uh, rapid pacing has really been uh, an advance for this technology. You know, I just got back from Tokyo Valves and their sites there, they're using ice to land specifically where they want to on the membranous septum and they have pacemaker rates mm. with septum expanding valves at 1.2%. Yeah. Uh, that's wow. complex. Yeah. Yeah, Ibrahim, what's your pacemaker rate in all those patients? So it's in the single, if you take out our, our baseline, you know, if you take out the second degrees, et cetera, it's about 8%. So, and that's, an, it's again, keep in mind, it's only an extreme and high risk patient yeah. population, right? If you look back and think about what the low risk trial pacemaker rates were, uh, not, not too different uh, from that. So, you know, I anticipate that as we see this in, in low and intermediate risk patients, the pacemaker rate is going to continue to go down. And with evolution and technique, quite frankly, I mean, you know, <clears throat> we, we have learned quite a bit over the past uh, 100 or so porticos, and, and we're learning every day on this. I mean, uh, the nice part about this is, quite frankly, is, as we pointed out, there's a lot of forgiveness is where you land. And because of the large cell design, you don't see that high pacemaker rate. And then, you know, we're not religious about looking at the membrane septum. But in general, if you follow, you know, the dot on the screen, land at about three millimeters, you're going to be in good shape with a single pacemaker rate for the most part. And, you know, these, so these high extreme risk patients in, in their 80s, if you look correct. at the ones coming into the trial right now, 60% of them have underlying, those without a pacemaker, underlying conduction defects mm -hmm. that put them at risk mm -hmm. of a pacemaker. And I suspect a number yeah. of them, if we did studies on beforehand, probably should have had a pacemaker when they came in. Mm -hmm. I mean, these Absolutely. are high-risk patients. We have and if you look at minutes. Ganesha's data, right? Yeah. Sorry, again. So go ahead. Uh, we have five more minutes to finish. So sure. Good. No, I think, Murray, if you look at Ganesh Manoharan's data, I mean, he has a 4% pacemaker rate. What Mike's quoting is single. So I, I think it's possible to get there. Perhaps, uh, you know, I think 4% is ambitious uh, for a high extreme risk patient population, but, but very comfortably within single digits. Uh, I think the, the other point there, you know, as you guys are mentioning, having a pacemaker before, you, we all know that the threshold for an EP to put in a pacemaker with a right bundle and a left anterior fascicular block seems to be much different the day after TAVR than it is two days before or a week before the TAVR. <laughs> That's the problem that we've run into. Yeah. Uh, so I, certainly I think, you know, if you look at some of these data sets where we've got patients who, you know, potentially in other countries are having a pacemaker for their right bundle prior to having their TAVR done, we're certainly going to see much lower rates. But in our high-risk patient population, we've been very satisfied with the rates we've seen. Well, I have to say one thing that what we've seen this morning is the problem we're having with the advances with TAVR and our teams, they're getting so good, is all the cases are done with time to spare. And Maurice has to find <laughs> more questions for everybody. Exactly. Yeah, <laughs> so I'll, I'll, so I'll, 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 one more for me. Uh, Maurice, Dan want to say Dan Dan yeah. oh, Go ahead. Go ahead. Along that line, what Mike said, seeing this valve deployed this way, what would the panel think? I know the FTA is not here. Why would we need a randomized trial to now prove it good for intermediate low risk patients? Any comments on the panel on that? What's the question? Is the question why are we ago, running a low risk trial? <laughs> 10 years well, ago, but this is 2023. Yeah. With the experience of being a well, again, it, it, you know, first of all, I'm happy to run any trial that the industry is going to pay for. So thank you, uh, Abbott. <laughs> uh, but the, the, the FDA is just not going to let us get by without running a trial. I mean, I, I guess I agree with you. you know, these things are getting so good. I, I'm beginning to think that we're somehow over trialing some of these valves. But um, you know, for those of us with an academic yeah. interest, we're generating the data that we really need. Well, you know, I would say before the FDA, arm, that would be uh, yeah. It wasn't that long ago they was, were mandating all, all valves to uh, be randomized, and now I think uh, we're probably... Well, no, I don't, think we can, yeah. I don't really think we can randomize against surgery anymore. That's just not, not against happen. surgery. We, we won't, we won't yeah. fill it up. For sure. A single-arm <laughs> trial. And eventually, I think we've reached, we've got so much data that going to objective performance goals, just like in surgery, makes a lot of sense to me. One for me. Rich, Sentinel. show us the EKG Sentinel. one more time first, please. Are you, are you still using Sentinel? Why? And every, yeah. every patient. So good question. So let me, let me comment on the FDA thing. I was going to say you're going to have to convince uh, 
uh, Medtronic and 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 uh, Edwards first before convincing the FDA about not letting it low in intermediate risk trials. So good luck with that. Can we show the EKG the screen EKG rather first? than the hemodynamics? So the, as far as the Sentinel, you know, we used to use universal Sentinel in every single patient, yeah. and obviously after TCT presentation last, you know, last year, that our concept has changed completely. Now we do this selectively, and as Amber pointed out, we look at patient, patients with very high calcium burden and cusps, such as bicuspids, valve and valves, prior stroke like this particular patient, uh, perhaps dialysis patients. We just don't know is the reality. Uh, and it's hard for us to see a decrease in stroke, but patients continue to ask. Uh, and you know, when we know that somebody's at an elevated risk of stroke, you know, it's reasonable for us to offer them Sentinel, but we plan this ahead of time and have this conversation with patients in clinic uh, and really go over the data. So you don't do it 100%. just to yeah, you don't do it. No, we don't. We patients. no. But before uh, before TCT 2022, we did, and not anymore. Changed. And the problem is, you know, we, we're really looking forward to to some guidance with who who is a high risk patient and what is the high risk category. If difficult. you ask ten centers, I think they'll give yep. you a list yep. of five different things that make their patients high risk, which may or may not corroborate the others. So that's really what we're looking forward we, to. We uh, argue, just to give you a thirty we second. Every day. That's the problem. <laughs> Just to give you a 30 second yeah. case wrap up here, you yeah. can see yeah. our hemodynamics yep. on the screen again. This is a paste. The patient has mm -hmm. a pacer, but is not paced. Uh, we've got a very narrow complex. We've got good sinus rhythm. Our echo shows a mean gradient of five with no significant PVL. Uh, LV, as Dr. Reardon pointed out, still banging away. Um, so we're pretty happy with the result here. So you have another minute. Yeah. Tell us, your, tell us your, how you're going to handle this patient. Recovery room, floor, home tomorrow. How do you do this? Yeah, so I mean, she doesn't. I, we don't even see a bundle now, right? So, well, she'll go to the recovery room. She'll go to the floor uh, tomorrow morning. She'll get an echo at 7:30 in the morning. Or our, our, our sonographer, Stephanie's here. We'll do it. We'll take a look at the echocardiogram. Uh, we hope she'll be home by 10 o'clock. So, if you have patients to have repeat pacemaker five days thereafter, do you have it? That have you seen it? Where patients? So, good go question. Home? Yeah. So, we we actually just were talking about this. <laughs> Most patients who we need to do a pacemaker after a Navator portico, we know right away. Mm -hmm. And it, part of that is, you know, by the time the nose cone and the delivery system goes and tickles the membranous septum, we know that answer right away. And a majority of these have pre-underlying pre bundles or arrhythmia issues. The, typically, what we see the delayed pacemaker rate, we haven't seen this in the Navator or portico platform, at least in our, in our, you know, the past 100 or so patients. We have seen it, however, and more so in the balloon expandable, because that's when we're more comfortable. We know that those pacemaker rates are going to be low. Patients go home, then come back with, with heart blocker problems. Yeah, any, any discharge, same day uh, at your program. I mean, this, she's got a pacemaker. We, we, we have got not, we've gotten no. to... Yeah, we, we've gotten to 90% uh, next day discharge, but yeah. same day discharge, we've not been that adventurous quite yet. Uh, uh, we saw some talks on, on Dr. Wood and Dr. Webb's data yesterday uh, talking about same day discharge down there with you guys. And, uh, you know, I, I think part, part of that is a, a lot of that information is in balloon expandable valves. We do yeah. use balloon expandable valves. It's clearly a minority uh, of our cases here, okay. uh, but we have not ventured that far from that perspective and a reimbursement perspective. And, just, yeah, yeah. More importantly, towers and inpatient DRG. Exactly. Yep. First, That's it. First, exactly. Maybe not. different in Canada. <laughs> so. Excellent presentation. <laughs> we love a lot. Great. Thank you very, very much. And we move forward. Thank you very much. Thanks for having us, guys. Take care, guys. Con congratulations. You know, this is, was the premier live case of Navitor. Uh, really.